มิสองถึงคุณเทคโนโลยีเปลี่ยนแปลงและสิ่งที่เราต้องการคือการเปลี่ยนแปลงของระบบที่เราต้องการคือการเปลี่ยนแปลงของระบบที่เราต้องการคือการเปลี่ยนแปลงของระบบที่เราต้องการคือการเปลี่ยนแปลงของระบบที่เราต้องการคือการเปลี่ยนแปลงของระบบที่เราต้องการคือการเปลี่ยนแปลงของระบบที่เราต้องการคือการเปลี่ยนแปลงของระบบที่เราต้องการคือการเปลี่ยนแปลงของระบบที่เราต้องการคือการเปลี่ยนแปลงของระบบที่เราต้องการคือการเปลี่ยนแปลงของระบบที่เราต้องการคือการเปลี่ยนแปลงของระบบที่เราต้องการคือการเปลี่ยนแปลงของระบบที่เราต้องการคือการเปลี่ยนแปลงของระบบที่เราต้องการคือการเปลี่ยนแปลงของระบบที่เราต้องการคือการเปลี่ยนแปลงของระบบที่เราต้องการคือการเปลี่ยนแปลง Data is the backbone of our smart nation initiative. At present, there is only one fiber infrastructure backbone in Singapore. This makes sense from the point of view of affordability, but it creates a single point of failure. For example, consumers will remember how the fire in Singtel's Bukit Panjang Exchange Building in 2013 affected consumers in, from multiple operators in the northern and western parts of Singapore. While well, some people joke that denying people Wi-Fi is a violation of their human rights, it is no laughing matter as such disruptions have serious consequences for both individuals and businesses. Former Minister Jakob identified redundancy as one of the four core components of a resilient network, the others being diversity, resistance, and recovery. The traditional argument against building another totally separate network is the prohibitive cost. While the cost of not having backup are constantly rising, the cost of building such a network are coming down as technology advances. Connectivity providers in the UK are exploring creative solutions to traditional network laying, sewers, spare electricity cable ducts, highways, overhead lines, and rail networks are being explored for the right of way to lay cables. This creative approach to new networks is also being seen at the government level. For example, in the UK, the wastewater pipe network of Thames Water is being used to deploy fiber optic cables, instantly creating new cost-effective and diverse connections in key business areas. The argument for an alternative fiber network is strong and getting stronger by leveraging existing infrastructure to reduce implementation costs and optimize asset use. The cost may not remain prohibitive. I believe there is also room for private operators to play a bigger role, so that the government would not have to shoulder the entire cost of implementation. But what is needed are clear rules to allow for the usage of existing infrastructure. I urge the relevant ministries to take a deeper look at the issue. We should also look at infrastructure from a sustainability perspective, and hence we return to a topic that, that I've addressed before: electric vehicles. What seemed like toys for rich geeks just a few years ago is now seen as the future of mobility. My second suggestion is to provide more charging points for EVs. Many countries are already laying plans to phase out combustion engines altogether. The UK and France have announced that sales of gasoline and diesel vehicles will no longer be allowed in their countries by 2040. The Indian government has indicated its intention to only allow electric vehicles to be sold in India by 2030. And China has raised the bar yet again for automakers when it announced late last month its proposal to implement aggressive new quotas for the production of new energy vehicles. The world is moving towards the adoption of EV, and such a move would be in line with our commitment to COP21. Singapore is well placed to take the lead in the adoption of EVs, but despite a small city, it's despite a small size that is perfect for EVs, adoption has been slow because of the lack of reliable access to charging. It is a chicken and egg problem. If there are no charging points, car owners will not adopt EVs. Private enterprises can play a role here. Blue SG is a co-funded program by the government to provide 100, oh, sorry, to provide 1,000 EVs and 2,000 charging points by the year 2020. However, only 20% of these charging points will be open to the public. One way is to open up more of these charging points to the public eventually, but without HDB and URA car park access. A pervasive network of public EV charging points will not be possible. The government needs to support and encourage more public-private cooperation in this space. My third suggestion is related to one of the common complaints that we hear from residents, that there is frequent congestion on roads due to what they perceive to be uncoordinated roadworks by different utilities. To them, 
we seem to be constantly digging up and patching up the same stretches of roads over and over again. Well, there are, of course, legitimate reasons for this. Can the coordination between utilities be optimized through the implementation of more common services tunnels, such as the one that we have in the Marina Bay area? Or would it be possible to leverage other tunnels, such as the deep tunnel sewerage system or the underground transmission cable tunnel? Such schemes can reduce traffic congestion, reduce risk of damage to utilities, and allow for easier access for maintenance and repairs. It is important to have a regulatory framework to allow these private or public tunnels to be accessed and utilized by all. At the same time, it ensures that utility owners are properly compensated. This is in the larger national interest of reducing congestion and improving productivity. Mr. Speaker, please let me now make three suggestions on how we can make the infrastructure enhancements possible. The first is to have a balance between public intervention and market solutions. We are moving into a much more challenging world, and the government needs to establish the right ground rules. There must be the appropriate balance between government intervention where it is needed and allowing the private sector to find the best solutions. Should the Yellow Pages rule that the government should not provide services that are already provided by private enterprises in the Yellow Pages continue to be our guiding principle? On more micro-initiatives, where the right solution might not be clear and where the private sector can find the best solution, the government should exercise greater caution before getting involved. An example is the many subsidies that we, are, that we are offering to SMEs to adopt technologies. Some vendors who are pre-approved, and it is great for them because they can be vetted for quality, but at the same time, their competitors are shut out, even if they develop a superior product. This can quickly become an accusation of favoritism, where insiders make lots of money and outsiders are left to wither on the vine. In contrast, for many of the infrastructure developments that I've just discussed, there are strong economic arguments for government intervention, as the private sector may not be willing to undertake the level of investment needed. Reliability and security are paramount for such projects. Given the scale and national importance, the government has to provide direction and ensure that the ministries coordinate across all levels in a whole of government approach. The second suggestion is to develop a regulatory framework for public and private cooperation. Where private stakeholders are involved, a framework must be created to ensure proper compensation to the stakeholders that finance and build each piece of infrastructure. While it is tempting to regulate by saying no to everything, this will not lead to the desired outcome. There must be some spirit of risk-taking because if you take no risks, you will reap no reward, and our nation will be the poorer for it. The final suggestion will be on alternative ways to finance infrastructure projects. Only the government has the financial clout to finance major infrastructure investments that we need. Infrastructure costs are long-term in nature while financing is short-term. If clear rules are in place that allows for private ownership, then government will not have to carry the entire burden of implementation. This transfers the risk from taxpayers to private companies. We can go even further than just borrowing to finance investment, as has been announced in the 2018 budget. Another way to finance infrastructure is through infrastructure trust. This has the benefit of democratizing ownership by allowing the man on the street to have a stake in infrastructure. This is similar to the use of REITs to allow more people to benefit from real estate ownership. There is, lots of, there is currently lots of appetite, both domestically and internationally, to finance long-term stable assets. Such a move will help to develop a deep, liquid, and transparent infrastructure market for the SGX. In conclusion, I believe that if we can strike a good balance between government intervention and private sector participation, by having clear guidelines and a robust regulatory framework, and allowing for commercial rights to be respected, and more flexible financial arrangements, uh, sorry, and more flexible financing arrangements, we can build a better Singapore for current and future generations of Singaporeans. Mr. Speaker, I support the motion.